This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Let us have a moment of silence. Are you thirsty? What are you thirsting for? to God's presence and never thirst again. We are parched and this journey is long. Come, let us journey toward the spring of living water. spirits are willing to receive your grace clear the clutter and the chaos we let go of all that holds us down and holds us back from your living water come and fill us up so that we may never thirst again we ask all things in the name of the one who calls us beloved amen
May our spirits be fed as we enter into a time of silent prayer. Let us pray. O Lord, you are our guide through this season of Lent, and you are like the sunrise after a troubled night, like the roadside oasis for the weary traveler, or the safe harbor in the storm, the guiding star for the searching pilgrim. O Lord, through your Son, Jesus Christ, you stretch out your hand to the invisible ones in our midst. You treasure what has been cast aside. You save what is lost. You reassure the anxious. And Lord, you mend the battered and remember the forgotten. You comfort those who grieve. Oh Lord, what would we do without you? For you seek us out and you find us. And Lord, we acknowledge that you have found us many times in our lives and that indeed in every chapter of our lives, you have been present with us. Sometimes in our dark valleys, sometimes in seeming endless suffering. And we did not always sense or feel your presence in those times. But looking back, we know we know that you were indeed with us. And we can see that we could never have been able to make it on our own. And an awareness comes that it was you who lifted and carried us when we were often paralyzed by fear, paralyzed by anxiety, by depression, and sometimes we just fell into self-pity. But always you were there and you lifted us. There were times, Lord, we're so grateful for those times when we felt your presence so clearly. When we saw and felt the hand of one whom you placed in our path, who reached out with a hand in an act of kindness that made all the difference in our lives. Sometimes it was in the prayer of the morning or in the reading of your scriptures. Sometimes in moments of mission with others, we sensed your presence oh so clearly. And Lord, as you have been there for us, you call us to be your persons, to be there for others who may have lost their way, who feel lost and feel alone. Oh, merciful God, help our troubled hearts always to find rest in you and gather our prayers and shape them to your purpose. O oh Lord, we pray this 
In the name of Jesus, who has taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning, church. Good morning, church. If for some reason somebody to your left or your right falls asleep this morning, please just uh, give them a little nudge, softly give them a nudge. Uh, we are in the midst of daylight savings time, so what a joy that is. In around 1030, if anybody walks through the door, just be kind to them, offer them Christian love. We want to remind uh, the women in the congregation that our circle meetings are this week for the United Women in Faith. Uh, there's two of them. You can read about them in your bulletin. I want to remind you if you'd like to sing with the cantata uh, that's going to take place on April the 29th, uh, that there is information in there about the special practices that will take place. Also, uh, we want to let you know that uh, you can start to think about the quarterly memorial service, which will be on March the 25th. There's information in your bulletin. It's always good when some of our church members come and share in that as well. There are two wonderful giving opportunities throughout the, this month. One of them is the United Methodist Committee on Relief, as I've shared with you before. Uh, this is the organization that we use that we support that is there when there's any kind of natural disasters of any kind, either in this country or around the world. This helps our church to be ready to respond right away to any needs that take place. We also want to remind you that, okay, Steve? <laughs> Didn't mean to call you out by name. <laughs> I love Steve, it's just that I was checking on him. Uh, the um, <laughs> what was I going to say next? We we, we were uh, the gathering. Also, the gathering this month we will be uh, using our virtual flowers for the Easter service. You'll be able to put down name of anybody that you'd like to honor, anybody that you'd like to remember. And that will be printed in the Easter Bulletin. And uh, all that will go, all those offerings will go to the gathering, uh, which is our partner in Middletown that we help in so many ways and join together in ministry. So we have giving opportunities every Sunday and every day. So we invite the ushers to come forward now as we present our tithes and our offerings.
We thank you, God, for the blessings of life. And we ask that you would accept our offering today so we can be a blessing. Allow us to do your work wherever you call us. We offer this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. This is really good. <laughs> you know, you can't get this everywhere. You can't. Um, water in some places comes at a premium. Uh, my, my, my younger brother, uh, in his retirement, he has uh, gone to Africa several times to dig wells in order that they might have water. There has been places I have been where you can see water, and maybe you have too, but you don't want to drink it. You don't want to drink it. Uh, you have to carry bottled water like that in order to be able to do the work that God has called you to, to do. Water is everywhere, but it's not always good. And water sometimes can be very powerful, very powerful. Uh, I have uh, seen what water can do in New Orleans, at Hurricane Katrina, in Houston, at Hurricane Harvey, and even close by in Brown County when the Ohio River uh, flooded. And one of the things about water is when you come back from doing flood work, a lot of times people will say to you, gee, you probably had to shovel up a lot of mud. You wish it was mud. Because when water comes through the area, it picks up whatever it goes over top of, of and deposit, deposits it in people's homes. When I did Ohio River flood relief, I did it at a cattle farm. It gave me good practice years ago for how I needed to dress during the pandemic. You had to have gloves, you had to have uh, a mask, you had to have uh, goggles, you just had to, in water had brought all that in. In fact, at that place, the water had lifted up a freezer and turned it sideways and dropped it on the ground with it open and nobody dealt with that till about six weeks later. Water is a good thing, and it's a powerful thing. It's a thing that uh, can quench our thirst. It's something that can clean us. And it is something that at times could even hurt us. You hear a lot about the Bi in the Bible about water. In Genesis, at the very beginning, the very beginning of creation, God breathed across the water and he found chaos and brought it into to some semblance of order. Moses, when he was in the desert, it was Moses that, that said to, that the people were thirsty and went to God and said, we need water. And, and at Horeb, God Ask him to break over the rock, and in there he found water. In Revelation 21, at the very end of Scripture, it talks about that we will drink for eternity through a water with, of a water of life, water that refreshes us today, tomorrow, and forever. Water comforts, 
Water cleanses, water destroys. I want to tell you a story this morning about a woman who came because she wanted water. She came and encountered Jesus as she looked for water. This comes from John chapter 4. Jesus had to pass through Samaria. He came into Sychar, and a Samaritan village that bordered the field of Jacob had given to his sons Joseph. Jacob's well was still there. Jesus, worn out by the trip, sat down at the well, and it was noon. A woman, a Samaritan, came to draw water. Jesus said, would you give me a drink of water? His disciples had gone to the village to buy food for lunch. The Samaritan woman was taken aback and asked, how come you, a Jew, are asking me, a Samaritan woman, for water? <clears throat> Jews in those days wouldn't be caught dead talking to a Samaritan. Jesus answered, if you knew the generosity of God and who I am, you would be asking me for a drink, and I would give you fresh, living water. The woman said, Sir, you don't even have a bucket to draw with, and this well is deep. So how are you going to get this water? Are you a better man than our ancestor Jacob, who dug this well and drank from it? He, is, he and his sons, and for his livestock, and passed it on to us. Jesus said, everyone who drinks this water will get thirsty again and again. Anyone who drinks the water I will give you will never thirst, not ever. The water I give will be an artesian spring within, gushing fountains of endless life. The woman said, sir, give me this water so I don't have to ever be thirsty again. He said, go and call your husband to come back. I have no husband, she said. That's nicely put. I have no husband. You've had five husbands. The man you're living with now is not your husband. You spoke the truth, sure enough. Oh, so you're a prophet as well. Our ancestors worship God at this mountain, but you Jews insist that Jerusalem is the only place for worship, right? But the time is coming, Jesus said, and it is fact has come. When, you, when what, you're, what you're called will not matter, and where you go to worship will not matter. It is who you are and the way that you live that counts before God. Your worship must engage your spirit in the pursuit of truth. That's the kind of people the Father is out looking for. Those who are simply and honestly themselves before him in their worship. God is sheer, is sheer being itself. The spirit. Those who worship him must do it out of their very beings. And do it with the spirit and be true to their selves in adoration. The woman said, I don't know about that. I do know that the Messiah is coming, and when he arrives, we'll get the whole story. I am he, said Jesus. You don't have to wait any longer or look any further. Just then, the disciples came back, and they were shocked. They couldn't believe he was talking with the, that kind of woman. No one said what we were all thinking, but their faces showed it. The woman took the hint and left. In her confusion, she left her water pot. Back in the village, she told the people, come and see a man who knew all about the things I did and who knows me inside and out. Do you think this could be the Messiah? And they went out to see for themselves. In the meantime, the disciples pressed him, Rabbi, eat, aren't you going to eat? He told them, I have food to eat you know nothing about. 
The disciples were puzzled. Who could have brought that food? Jesus said, the food that keeps me going is to do the will of the one who sent me. And then he said, the harvester is waiting. He's taking his pay, gathering his grain that's ripe for eternal life. Now the sower is in the arm in arm with the harvester, triumphant. That's the truth of the saying. This sows that one harvest. I sent to harvest you a field that never, has never been worked. Without lifting a finger, you have walked in on the field, worked long and hard by others. Many Samaritans from the village committed themselves to him because of the woman's witness. We knew all about things I did. He knows me inside and out. They asked him, ask him to stay on, so Jesus stayed for two days. A lot more people entrusted their lives to him, and they heard what he had said. And then the woman said, we're no longer taking this on as say so. We've heard it ourselves, and we know for sure that he is the savior of the world. There is value in spiritual hydration. Coming to the living water. Jesus said, everyone who drinks this water will get thirsty again and again. This water. Anyone who drinks the water I will give will never thirst, not ever. The water I give will be an artesian spring within, gushing fountains of endless life. How many times have you been to the well? The well that Jesus has to offer. Friday after uh, Debbie and I went to the rec center, we got in the car and if she remembers, the first thing I did was what? I grabbed water. I grabbed water because I had been busy walking around a track and it was time for me to take some water. I was busy and I needed refreshment. I have to admit, I can't think of a place any more busy than this one right here. Otterbein is constantly busy. I hear so often in retirement how busy you all are. Well, busyness is a good thing, and I, I, I praise God for the programming that takes place here. I think that this place has more to offer than any place, bar none. But I want to invite you this morning to consider stopping occasionally and drinking that living water, going to the fountain of Jesus, and just spending time alone with him, and talking with him, and sometimes confessing to him, because we all have shortcomings. In verse 15 through 18, it says, the woman said, sir, I, give me this water so I won't be, get thirsty. Won't even have to come back to the well again. He said, go call your husband and then come back. I have no husband, she said. See, she was in the process of confessing what God had already known, but at the same time, there was power in her confession. What is it in your life that you think God doesn't already know? What is it in your life that you think that God already doesn't know? When the woman encountered Jesus, she confessed to him, and he already knew. And it gave her hope as she drank from this living water. 
And she went to the fountain, to the well, when? At noon. Why? Because she was a woman of ill repute. And if she went in the morning when everybody else was gathered at the fountain, gathered at the, at the well, she would have felt uncomfortable. She wouldn't have felt welcome. So here we are in the morning. We're at the well. Who is it? Who is it that will have to wait later to come because they don't feel comfortable among us? Yet Jesus took this woman with a reputation and offered her living water. Why should we be any different? Why should we be any different? Jesus talks about in verse 39 through 42 that there's a harvest coming. There's a harvest of people who need to know of the love, mercy, and grace of Jesus Christ who have been pushed out in so many ways by his own church, by his own church. See, what, what, what this woman did after encountering Jesus, after feeling forgiveness, after feeling love, she went and told her friends. Experienced. There is value in storytelling. What is your story of what Jesus has done for you in your life? How do you tell that story? How do you, perhaps as they use the term, come up with your elevator speech? If you were in an elevator for a minute, what would you want to tell people about Jesus? Who is it that you need to tell? We say that we offer the love of Christ to this community. I did some math this week, probably this morning here, on every, any given Sunday, maybe 15% of the community is sitting here right now. And maybe a little bit over 35% might be listening right now, or miss listening later. So, the majority of the folks who are right here in this community may not hear a message that you have to give of what it's meant to you to go to living water and to offer grace, mercy, and love, not guilt. Jesus did not guilt this woman. Not fear. Jesus did not tell this woman to be afraid of anything. Jesus tells us tons of times not to be afraid. But what Jesus did was offered her this grace, mercy, and love that he called living water. She was affected by it. She was changed. And then she could not wait to tell everyone he, she knew. We have a message. We have living water, which says that we have a fountain that we can offer with water that does not go away, but quenches today, tomorrow, and forever. The woman said, we're no longer taking this on as say so. We've heard it ourselves and know it to be true. He's the savior of the world. That's our message, a message of hope to everyone we encounter.
Your homework this week is to hydrate, to spiritually hydrate, to stop out of your busyness and take time to drink in what God has for you. And once you've had a good quenching drink of God's mercy, God's grace, God's love, then go tell somebody. Go tell somebody, not with guilt, not with fear, but with joy of what God has given you in mercy, grace, and love. And go out in Jesus' name. Amen.
try to get in around as people are going out as best we can. We just sort of try to get in around people. Yeah, I didn't know how quickly we started to dismantle. That's why we were standing up there. <laughs> well, we do as we can. Uh -huh. You know, sometimes they go out a little faster and sometimes they go out a little slower. Yeah. Well, we're usually the last ones to leave because we're toxic people. I just enjoy it so much. And you guys did so much. She just loves what she does. <laughs> yeah. I do too, right?
Say gallery. Yeah, gallery Media Center. If, what? You, if you go up to the to the place where you eat, yeah. And instead of going to the cafeteria, you go the other way. Okay, it's up there by uh, Kendra's office. 